In the autumn of 1930, a big-shot British explorer named Bertram Thomas embarked on a legendary quest. He aimed to be the first European to tackle the daunting Rub al-Khali, a super-harsh desert in Arabia, known as the Empty Quarter, to the English speakers, a place spanning around 250,000 square miles. It sprawled through Saudi Arabia, Oman, the United Arab Emirates, and Yemen in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. This desert was a real beast, larger than France, loaded with 800-foot-tall sand dunes that made it a nightmare for travelers. Before we begin I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. If you are not subscribed I recommend you to subscribe and activate the bell so you don't miss any video that are uploaded every day. Alright, let's keep rolling. But if anyone had a shot at crossing this monster, it was Bertram Thomas. He was born in Somerset, England, in 1892, and during World War I, he got shipped off to Mesopotamia. He clicked with the area and its people, fighting alongside locals and even becoming a top political advisor to the Sultan of Oman. He knew the lay of the land and how to survive. So, on October 6, 1930, he took off from Salala on Oman's coast, rolling with 25 Bedouin guides for his historic run. He recounted, we headed north over the Kara Mountains, about 3,000 feet high, cruising through frankincense groves and diving into the vast steppe. For the next 59 days, Thomas went off the radar. His own government had zero clue where he was or what he was up to. If they knew, they'd probably have slammed the brakes on his plan. Thomas had to pull this off on the down low. No rescue squad was coming if things hit the fan. Then, on February 5, 1931, boom, Thomas popped up in Doha, Qatar, all good and with a ton of goodies scooped up from the desert. He'd bagged over 400 natural history items, 21 of which were brand new to Western science. But it wasn't just these scientific gems that Thomas snagged. Nope, he also grabbed something jaw-dropping, a story. His Bedouin guide spilled the beans about an ancient lost city buried under the sand. One of the guides laid it out, there was this epic city, our old folks say, loaded with treasures, date gardens, and a fortress made of red silver. Now it's buried in the sands, a few days trot to the north. Thomas was swamped with his desert crossing, so he couldn't chase after this lost city. But he planned to come back for it. Fate had other ideas, though. He never made it. But he did jot down the story in his killer book, Arabia Felix, and let me tell you, it stirred up a storm among European readers. One dude who got hooked on this Lost City yarn was none other than T.E. Lawrence, also known as Lawrence of Arabia. He scribbled to his pals, I'm sold on the idea that an ancient Arab civilization's leftovers are buried in that desert. Arabs swear they've seen the wrecked castles of the great king, Ad, son of Kin, Ad, somewhere in the area. These Arab tales usually have some juice to them. Lawrence had plans to hunt for this lost city but got cut short by a tragic motorcycle crash in 1935. Before he punched out, though, Lawrence dropped a name for this enigmatic city, Atlantis of the Sands. Can you dig it? A lost city, an Atlantis of the Sands, maybe just chilling there, waiting to be found? 
In the Quran, there's this record of an ancient crew that stumped historians and scholars for ages, the Ad, a tribe in a spot called Iram. Here's the kicker, they're nowhere to be found in the texts of Judaism or Christianity. Which is odd, cause all three of these Abrahamic religions are built on the same history, talking about the same old tribes and events. Think King Solomon, Moses, the Egyptian Pharaoh, Noah and the Flood, you name it, they're in the holy books of all three traditions. But not the Ad. Their claim to fame? They're mentioned in the Quran when Muhammad gives a heads up to non-believers, saying, Ever wonder how your Lord dealt with Ad, the Iram tribe, who had these crazy tall pillars, like nothing else in the land? Scholars scratch their heads, asking why the Ad from Iram aren't name-dropped elsewhere, especially if they were building stuff that was out of this world. Did these ad peeps really exist? And if they did, what went down with them? The Quran's got the deets on this second question, and it's wild. According to it, the ad of Iram were a crew on the Arabian Peninsula post Noah's flood. They built a mega kingdom, flexing their wealth and skills to construct monuments on every high spot, and build palaces as if they were immortal. They weren't shy about throwing their weight around, dominating lots of neighbors. The Quran's pretty blunt about it, when they took, they took like tyrants. During their glory days, the folks from Iram got too big for their britches. They went all idol worship and got pretty rotten. That's ad for you. They ignored their Lord's signs, dissed his messengers, and hung on to every stubborn tyrant's orders. So, Allah sent Prophet Hud to warn these Iram people to straighten up. But guess what? They were stubborn as mules. To make them see the light, Allah hit them with a gnarly drought. At its peak, Hud pleaded with them, but they were stone-cold deaf. Then, they saw a cloud formation rolling in, thinking it was finally rain, that they were saved. But nope. Hud dropped truth bombs, nah, this ain't rain. Brace yourselves for a brutal wind carrying a painful punishment. Those clouds? Not rain. It was a sandstorm, and it wrecked them big time. As the Quran tells it, Ad got wiped out by a furious, bitter wind. Allah kept it going non-stop for seven nights and eight days, leaving them sprawled like uprooted palm trees. Not a soul survived. And just like that, the story of Iram's Ad ended. According to the Quran, their city got wiped out by a sandstorm, buried like it never existed. Scholars debate if this story's just a warning or if there's an ancient kingdom really lurking in those Arabian sands. But hey, the Ad of Iram isn't only found in the Quran. Flash forward to the 9th century CE, when a book was getting cooked up in Syria, destined to become a major player in the literary world, Alf Layla Wa Layla, or 1001 Nights. This book's basic deal? A Persian king finds out his wife's been playing around and offs her. He then goes on a marrying spree, but each morning after the wedding, he chops his new bride. Eventually, he ties the knot with a woman named Scheherazade, who starts spinning stories on their wedding night but holds back the endings. The king's hooked and keeps her alive to hear the endings each night. These stories? They're ancient Persian myths, and after a thousand and one nights, the king lets Scheherazade live happily ever after. 
This book started in the 9th century and got beefed up over time, adding stories from Iraq in the 9th and 10th centuries, then tales from Egypt and Syria in the 13th. As centuries passed, it became a living record of Middle Eastern stories and myths. It hit Europe in 1704, first in French, then exploding into English, German, Italian, Dutch, Danish, and Russian by the late 18th century. It's still in print worldwide, shaping our understanding of the region's history. But here's the kicker, within 1001 Nights, there's a tale worth highlighting, the story of Abdullah bin Ali Kalaba. He ventures into the desert searching for his lost camel and stumbles upon a jaw-dropping deserted city. I get off my ride, shake off the sand, and enter the city. The castle had these massive gates, decked out in all sorts of bling, white, red, yellow, green, you name it. I'm mind blown. Inside, there are palaces shining in gold and silver, decked with all kinds of jewels and pearls. I'm thinking, this must be the paradise promised for the afterlife. Abdullah hauls back from this city and rushes to spill the beans to the local bigwigs. He describes everything he saw, even showing off some of the treasures he found. Abdullah, the guy who stumbled onto the lost city, spills his story to the officials, and they're gobsmacked. But they want backup. So they fetch this expert who's all about these things. And when they ask him about this majestic city, he's like, yep, that's the one, Iram with the epic pillars, like nothing ever seen before. Shaddad, son of Ad the Greater, built it. This expert spins a tale about King Shaddad and his city, Iram of the Pillars. Shaddad was the big boss ruling solo over the earth. He found these old books talking about paradise and got the bright idea to make it here on earth. He had a colossal crew working under him, hundreds of thousands of kings, each with their own army. They went all in on constructing this paradise city for their king. But right when Shad Dad was about to see it with his own eyes, boom, disaster struck. A thunderous noise hit from the heavens, blasting Shad Dad and his crew, total wipeout. They never laid eyes on the city. Plus, Allah wiped out the path leading there, and the city remained hidden in the sand. Now, Abdullah's story seems to fit in with and expand on the Quran's tale of the Ad of Iram. Could there really be a lost city buried deep under the Arabian sands, a paradise lost? For eons, scholars brushed off the legendary lost city of Iram as pure religious symbolism or fiction. But in the 70s, the game changed. Paolo Mathii, an archaeologist from the University of Rome, heads to Marduk in northern Syria in 1964. At first, nada. Just a few bits and pieces. But in 68, they strike gold, a statue dedicated to the goddess Eshtar, with an ancient inscription, Ibit Lim, King of Ebla. This was massive. Ebla was this ancient city mentioned in texts of old but lost to modern times until now. Mathii and his squad keep digging and hit the jackpot in 74, 42 clay tablets in an ancient palace. And that's just the beginning. There were thousands of these tablets stashed underground, preserved like they were in a kiln due to a fire that wrecked the place. Talk about luck for historians. The tablets spill the beans on Ebla and its neighbors, giving the lowdown on Damascus, Gaza, Byblos, Lebanon, the works. 
It was like peeking backstage at these places during that era, more detailed than ever. But what shook everyone was the mention of one place in particular, the city of Iram. The tablets call it the legendary Iram, the city of towers, seeming to confirm the Iram with lofty pillars, from the Quran and the lofty palaces in 1001 nights. It's like finding a treasure trove of history confirming the existence of this mythical city. Abdullah Al Said, a neurologist and part time archaeologist, stumbled upon a peculiar stone wall in the Hirat Kabar lava fields in Saudi Arabia while casually exploring with a hobbyist group in 2004. Back then, he didn't pay much mind to it. Fast forward to 2008, with Google Earth rising in popularity, Al Said took another look and had a revelation. He saw not just one or two, but hundreds of these peculiar structures, which he dubbed gates, spread across the vast area. Feeling out of his depth, Al Said sent the photos to David Kennedy, a seasoned archaeologist at the University of Western Australia. Kennedy, with 40 years of experience documenting Arabian Peninsula structures, dove into investigating these gates. By 2017, Kennedy's team had uncovered about 400 of these structures, some stretching hundreds to thousands of feet long, with walls up to 30 feet thick. But the mystery lingered, the purpose of these structures remained elusive. Kennedy couldn't peg them as living quarters, animal traps, or burial sites. The plot thickened by 2021 when researchers tallied over 1,000 of these structures, now named mustatals, across nearly 100,000 square miles. And get this, they dated these enigmatic formations to over 7,000 years old, older than Stonehenge. But the deeper they dug into the mystery, the more confounding it became. Why were some structures visible while others seemed hidden? How did ancient people communicate to construct these from afar? And how on earth did they manage to build some on mountainsides and volcanoes? This archaeological riddle in Saudi Arabia is just one of many puzzling discoveries cropping up in the region recently. Take, for instance, the massive stone circle found in the Golan Heights in 2015, matching Stonehenge's age. As these mysteries stack up, they're raising more questions than answers, leaving experts scratching their heads in search of the truth. The discovery of these massive stone circles, ancient roadways, and monumental burial avenues in the Arabian Peninsula has sparked immense curiosity among archaeologists and historians. The circles, dubbed the Wheel of Giants, comprising five enormous structures, each around 500 feet in diameter, nearly double the size of Stonehenge, are captivating experts. David Kennedy notes the presence of similar big circles across the region, raising questions about their purpose and the civilization that constructed them. Moreover, the unearthing of vast funerary avenues stretching thousands of miles, linking oases and marked by numerous burial monuments, poses an enigmatic puzzle about an ancient civilization's capabilities in constructing such extensive structures. Some archaeologists believe these discoveries could revolutionize our comprehension of the early history of the Middle East. They draw connections to the Quran's description of the Ad of Iram, portraying them not only as a powerful tribe with economic might but also as physically imposing individuals, capable of immense feats. These descriptions align with the notion of giants, 
reminiscent of the biblical Nephilim from the book of Genesis, renowned for their colossal size and strength. Connecting further to Islamic beliefs, there's a mention of the jinn, also known as the Old Ones, believed to have intermingled with humans and potentially built the city of Iram. Intriguingly, the ancient Arabic word for pillar, as in Iram of the pillars, holds another meaning, Old One. The stone mustatals found across the region, known to local Bedouin tribes as the works of the old men, further fuel the speculation about these ancient giants. Could these giants from Abrahamic traditions, the Jinn, the Ad of Iram, and the Nephilim, be responsible for these massive structures and the ancient roadways connecting them? The quest for answers might extend beyond the conventional teachings of Abrahamic religions, delving into another ancient text, the Book of Enoch. This banned book offers a dramatic narrative shedding light on ancient giants and potentially humanity's history itself. If you're intrigued by what the Book of Enoch might unveil about ancient giants and the wider historical context, it seems there's a video available on this topic, along with a documentary showcasing historical accounts and newspaper articles discussing encounters with giants in remote places. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.